Hello and welcome to a video. This is a video for DGST 101, that's Intro to Digital Studies, a class at the University of Mary Washington in the summer 2021 term. I am the professor Zach Whalen and I am still traveling. This is uh, another video that I'm recording from my in-laws guest bedroom. So hello, it's good to see you all again. Um, well, I can't really see you, but you know what I mean. Uh, students, this is week three, and so this is a week dedicated to the physical side of digital media, and you've been learning a bit about how digital objects, electronic objects, electronic devices are made. Uh, that includes the resources that are mined to produce them, and then the labor that goes into manufacturing them, and we've learned a bit about some of the problems around both of those things. Um, today, we're going to continue learning about some problems, uh, unfortunately, but uh, these problems now have to do with what happens in the future. So uh, that's going to be our, our big topic for, you, for today for you to learn about. In today's video, I'm going to give you some thoughts, show you some things to look at on your own, and then I'll also spend some time explaining how to work on the object lesson assignment, which, was, which is the big project for this week. I'd like to recap, so here we go. This is a recap of week three. On day one, which was probably Tuesday for you, you learned about smartphones and the life cycle of smartphones by playing a video game called Phone Story, and you learned about coltan mining by reading an essay. Now, one of the things I talked about yesterday in yesterday's video was that uh, another kind of subliminal theme this week is that different media convey arguments in different ways. And on that first day of the week, you played a video game and you read an essay, and I hope you were able to notice some of the different ways that those two different uh, media communicate ideas in pretty different ways that are unique to their forms. Video games have processes, uh, essays have uh, text and imagery uh, that they can make us think about. Uh, then on Wednesday of this week, you learned about labor practices and allegations of some worker reviews at Apple factories or Apple suppliers, and we you learned about that by listening to a podcast and also reading the transcript of a different podcast. Um, so in that case, hopefully you got to think about how audio can, can convey a story, can make you feel different things. Um, today, you're going to be learning about e-waste, and you're going to be doing that by watching two films, two short films or, or videos that are available uh, on YouTube, and you'll be thinking about how they, what they have to tell, tell you about e-waste and e-recycling and sort of what happens next after we're done with our devices. On Friday, I will basically just be wrapping up the week, but mainly talking about um, how to work with Timeline JS, which you'll need to do in order to complete the object lesson assignment. So for today, uh, these two videos are what I would like for you to watch. On the one hand, it's a segment from PBS NewsHour, which is a just a news show on PBS, and this is a segment from a few years ago now. Uh, about what happens to your uh, e-waste when it's recycled. Uh, it's a news segment, and so you have different things that are typical for news segments, like a host and a reporter and experts and titles on screens and so on. Uh, the next piece is, oops, I didn't want those to start playing, um, but that's kind of interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, e-waste land is a short piece, uh, relatively short, it's about 20 minutes long, as you see here on YouTube, and this is a, a short film that addresses a pretty similar topic but in a very different way and I'd like for you to look at both of these and compare and contrast how they say what they have to say which is I think pretty similar but in very different ways and they might have different effects or different impacts. So for the PBS NewsHour piece you notice that there's a narrator, a reporter explaining things and then you'll notice in eWasteland there is no voiceover. There is no framing statement about what we're seeing. We just have to see what we see and um, decide how we feel about it. Uh, in the former sense, if the, the PBS news piece, uh, the, one of the major appeals that they make is to authority and expertise. We see different experts and authorities and we are presented with the idea that what they have to say is true because they are experts on what they're talking about. Uh, for e-wasteland, there are some different appeals. We see what we see and we decide how, how we feel about it. I, I think there's more of an emotional appeal there, but also we see just direct evidence and we decide how we feel about what we see just by just actually witnessing it on film here. So whatever you think about either of those, uh, talk about that in a Discord channel. I made that today. It's called Discuss E-Waste. Take a look at that. If you have a lot to say about either of these or, or both of them, uh, I think, again, a blog post is a great way to do that as opposed to talking about it in Discord just because a blog post gives you all the room you need to spread out your ideas. To go a little deeper on either or both of those films, I think it would be interesting to create a GIF or two to talk about specific moments that you find particularly interesting or compelling. And as you know, if you worked on the animated GIFs module, there are many ways you can make an animated GIF. Um, there are online GIF makers that you can use, and that all, all you need in that case is to plug in a URL. Um, I did find that the Giphy one won't work for the uh, e-wasteland film because it's too long. However, this one will. This is imgur, I-M-G-U-R.com, and they have this thing called vidgif, 
and it's um, you know it works so you just need to paste the URL for video and I know this is probably cropping in a way that you can't fully see it all but hopefully you'll get the idea um, and if I control V I paste that in here this is the video for eWasteland and submitting this will require me to prove I'm not a robot so let's see if I pass I made it okay great so um, one thing I did notice you do have to have an account on Imager but it's a free account and it, it works okay right so the way this works is like a lot of these similar things you just kind of slide to a point you're you're interested in I'm just going to pick this one randomly and then you hit create gif and it does the work to create the gif and the terminology for Imager is that it's trying to create a post you do have to give it a post so you need to give it something here I mean you need to give the post a title okay, let's say clip from the where's and and then you can decide how to post it. Uh, if you post it to community, that means it's going to be public. If you post it to be hidden, that's essentially like an unlisted video on uh, on YouTube. And then you can copy this link just like that, and then submit that and and or share it in Discord so that other people can see it. Uh, if you do that, what I'd like for you to do is share it and then talk about why you chose that particular moment, what you think it says, and what you think it convinces you of as a viewer. How do you how do you feel about it as a viewer? Um, I think that you will find lots of pretty compelling moments in E Wasteland. Sometimes some really beautifully filmed scenes, but of really tragic circumstances. So uh, that's a pretty uh, interesting thing to talk about. But anything else you find interesting at all, please. Uh, feel free to do that and likewise for the PBS thing too as well there's some interesting moments is there in, in there also so whichever you find uh, please make a gif or two and share those in discord and or post them on your blog if you choose to do it that way those are your main tasks for today uh, watch the two movies compare and contrast them discuss those in discord or your blog and make a couple gifts to do that comparing and contrasting for the rest of this video I want to talk about how to do the work for the object lesson project which is the big project for this week I've talked about this project a few times before, but I don't think it hurts to do it again. So here we go. This is a slightly more detailed explanation of it, I hope. Um, and step one, of course, is to choose an object. And this needs to be an object that uh, is an electronic device. It should be some kind of, you know, small consumer electronic, something that's relatively old, something you don't need, again, necessarily, because if you choose options one or three for this project, you're probably going to end up taking the thing apart and there is no guarantee that it will go back together again and, and continue working as it once did. So uh, bear that in mind as you choose whichever object. Um, make sure you do not choose anything that has a large screen on it because those will have different things in them that could hurt you very badly, so don't mess with those. Um, also be real careful around anything with batteries in it. Make sure you take the batteries out first before you do anything else. Um, if you are working on anything that has gears or moving parts in it, like a VCR, make sure you wear gloves because there will be some uh, lubricants in there. Uh, but those are just a few tips. I'll have a few more things to show you about taking some things apart in a minute. But first of all, choose an object, right? That's the main thing. Uh, step two, choose one of the following three timelines to investigate. Each of these objects has, uh, we've talked about four different stages in this life cycle, but for this project, I've, I'm just giving you three to focus on. The prehistory, which could include the mineral mining and, and the manufacturing, I guess. Um, the uh, option two would be to look at the lived history, which is the history of this object while it was your object. And then option three asks you to look at the afterlife, which is what happens to your object after it is no longer yours. What happens next? So choose one of those three things to focus on. Uh, whichever one you choose to focus on, you're going to do some investigation to figure out what you can about what happened along that particular timeline. And specifically, you're going to be trying to find and isolate and document up to 10 events about this object. I say up to 10, maybe it's, you know, at least, 10. I mean, look, strive for 10, basically. If you come up with five, but they're good, then that's fine. Um, but, you know, it, your, your, your mileage will vary on this because you will find that some objects have lots of interesting things in them and some uh, do not. And it's hard to predict sometimes. Um, I'm happy to give you advice about it based on my prior experience with these things, but um, even I don't know everything about these different objects, so uh, do your best is all I can ask. Uh, for each of these events, you're going to be trying to find out what you can about it, and specifically an event should include a time, a place, a description, and some media documenting it. So let me show you some examples for each of the three different timelines you might investigate. 
So if you're investigating the prehistory, you can often find out a lot about the microchips inside of your objects if you know what you're looking at and you do a little bit of investigating. And I did a little bit of that earlier today on a chip that I found, and I found that it was probably made in December of 2008 in this location in the Philippines, and there's a picture of it. So I would hope in your case that you might say a little bit more about it uh, in, in terms of that text instead of just listing that it was manufactured. For example, you could say, what is the chip and what does it do? Um, but that's, that's the minimum that you would need for an event for the prehistory timeline. For the lived history, you might have um, uh, actual photographic documentation like this, uh, but in this case you certainly should have a time, a place, and a description. So if there's a story that goes with that particular event, like maybe it's the time uh, you uh, cracked your phone screen and you had to get it replaced, or you let someone borrow it and they cracked the phone screen, um, tell the story around it around that particular uh, moment and document it as well as you can if you're talking about the lived history of this object. And then finally, you can think about the afterlife if you're choosing the afterlife timeline. In this case, this is a, an event that I've predicted will take place on July 1st, 5 billion years from now. And that is when the Earth is absorbed by the sun. And guess what? This circuit board, if I send this to a landfill, will probably still be in that landfill 5 billion years from now. So that is something that... Um, you know, we have to think about here, uh, but that's the that's an event probably that will happen uh, eventually on that timeline. That's the kind of thing that I'm looking for there. Okay, so whatever timeline you choose, you should have, you know, try for eight events on your, your timeline that you're focusing on, but you should still have some idea about the other ones. So for example, if you're working on the prehistory, try for like eight events for the prehistory, but then include at least one event speculating about the lived history and the afterlife, just to add that to your timeline that you, that you produce. Um, similarly, if you're going to work on option two for the lived history, have at least one reference to what happened before you owned it and one reference to what will happen after it. And then likewise uh, for the afterlife, if you are uh, focusing on that, then have at least one event for each of the other two timelines, just so those are, are there as well. If you choose option one, the prehistory, you're going to need to take apart your object in order to figure out what's inside of it because what you'll find is that even though there is a country of origin label somewhere on the outside of your object, the devices, the components on the inside might have come from different places and they will have their own country of origin labels and also they'll have some, they'll, they will have some more specific labels that can tell you a lot more about when and where these particular components come from. But taking apart a electronic object can be a little tricky, so here's some advice. When you're taking apart an electronic device, you don't need that many tools usually. Uh, of course, you need a good working place. A, this is a, a workbench. Um, it's often a good idea to have a couple different kinds of screwdrivers. This is a, just a basic flathead. This is a Phillips head. Um, you can also get specific kits for doing electronics that have special things like star bits and um, triangular bits and tri-wings and things. But you don't always need those um, unless you're doing something with Nintendo. But in fact, I am doing something Nintendo based today, but I don't need any of these special tools. Just a couple of screwdrivers. It's also often useful to have something like this. This is a bike tire remover, but it is also um, useful for prying apart plastic pieces. And if you're going to be doing anything super that's particularly complicated or, or thorny, it's often useful to have some wire cutters. Uh, if you do need to cut wires, definitely use a wire cutter. Do not use a knife to cut wires because you will slip and cut yourself instead. That has happened in a classroom once, so don't do that, but do this, uh, use wire cutters, they're great. Also, since you're dealing with plastic, sometimes plastic can shatter and little pieces can go everywhere, so uh, a pair of uh, safety glasses is a good idea too. This is the body of the Guitar Hero controller that I'm going to be taking apart, and I thought it would be useful to show you some things on the inside to um, kind of show you what some things are and explain a few things that you'll be looking for in your objects. So in this case, um, you know, of course, I, I got the neck off. That just kind of came off with a, cl uh, a lever. And I spent some time looking around here, and I noticed there's a lot of stickers on this, um, but there's no screws on the back. So it took me a minute to figure this out. Uh, in this case, there's a this white cover is a piece that covers up the screws. So I found that once I was able to get under this, I can just pop this off. And this is the kind of thing where you can pull it up without cracking it because there are these little tabs. And basically, I'm just pulling the tabs loose. I'm not breaking the plastic as I pull it up. So this is where this uh, 
tire remover thing is sometimes useful. You can kind of get under there and just go along the edge. Um, I'm in trouble there, but. Okay, that one's a little stuck, but let me come in from the other side. There it goes. Okay, so a couple more in the middle here. And you'll see these are just, this is pretty flexible plastic, even though it's hard, so. I don't think I'm going to break it. I hope not. Sometimes it can be a little bit, you know, iffy. Especially if there's a screw that you don't realize is still attached. But there we go, finally. Okay, so that just pops off. I say just, but that was pretty hard. And then um, uh, now on the inside I can see there's a bunch of screws. I've already taken these out actually just so I could make sure there was something in here, but each of these holes just had a Phillips head screwdriver in it. The only tricky part was that there was this one screw hole in this case that was covered with a sticker. The sticker said warning void if removed, uh, warranty void if removed, so I guess, you know, too bad. I've avoided the warranty. And now with that off, this just pops loose. It doesn't even really pop. There's not any clasps. And it comes off in two pieces. Now sometimes if you have a clamshell kind of thing, again, this this kind of tool is useful, but in this case, this one just sort of lifted off. And here we go. So I can give you a couple of, I can, well, I can tell you a few things about what's in here. First of all, let me get this cord loose so I can just look at one piece of this at a time. Um, looking in here, of course, the case is uh, a big part of this. This case is plastic, and this is ABS plastic. ABS plastic is a pretty common material for making toys. It is very durable and tough, and it is uh, technically recyclable, but usually not accepted at your local recycling center or your single stream recycling. So um, that is kind of a problem as we're thinking about the long-term life of these devices. This plastic um, is not usually recyclable unless you take it to a special place to have it recycled. Um, some other things are um, in here, of course, there's uh, these are wires. These are just like ribbon wires, wires glued together. Um, this, these brown pieces, the rectangle there, um, and then these green pieces, these green uh, rectangles, these are circuit boards. They're called printed circuit boards, uh, in these cases anyway, because if you can see here, there's wires. These are kind of wires embedded in the plastic. Um, it's actually uh, fiberglass, I think. Um, the resin and fiberglass sandwiched together to make this circuit board. And so this is a way that this, you can just kind of, when you're manufacturing this, you can just connect these end points. And you don't have, I don't have to worry about the internal stuff. So these are uh, printed circuit boards. And again, the main material that these are made out of is fiberglass, uh, fiberglass which again is not, um, like the ABS, is durable and tough and not really recyclable. So uh, it's tricky to deal with in the long term. Um, on the inside though, you see these little silver blobs. These are solder, and this is probably made of a material that has some copper in it and some other, some other metals. Um, those metals are recoverable in some cases in some kinds of recycling. And then you probably can't see on the video here, but these little tiny rectangles are kind of light brown. These are resistors, and those probably contain tantalum or coltan, which is what we learned about being uh, mined in Congo. This cylinder up here is a capacitor. It stores electrical charge temporarily. If you're taking apart something that has a bunch of these, or if it has really big ones, be extremely careful. In fact, if you see a big one of these, like walk away. Like if it's uh, the size of like a D battery or something, it can contain enough voltage to really, really injure you. So if you touch it the wrong way. So don't, don't mess around with these. This, this little one's fine, but if you see a big one, um, definitely be extremely cautious. Now the main thing that usually is interesting when you take apart a device like this is a chip, a microchip. Let me point with my screwdriver, I guess. So this is a microchip or an integrated circuit, and it's a black rectangle. Usually these are black squares or rectangles. And on a lot of electronic devices, you often will have lots of these, but in this case, there's just one. And I think that's because this peripheral, the controller here is, I mean, the guitar part, isn't really doing much of the work. The main thing that would be doing the work is the Wii remote that you would stick in to this rectangular space up here. And um, that would be a much more complicated bit of technology. Uh, I don't have that here, so um, all we have is this. And really, probably this is just in charge of um, receiving all of the switch signals from the button presses on the, the controller, uh, the peripheral, and then sending, sending that into the uh, Wii remote controller, which connects the, through this. So. The Wii remote controller would be much more complicated on the inside. It probably has quite a few different sensors and things. But uh, in this case, it's just the one. So not a whole lot of things to, to look at. Still, I'm trying to figure out the origins of this particular object and um, think about its potential futures. And so looking around, there are a few things that are worth noting about it. So um, let me see. Let me make sure this is in the shot. Um, 
you know, it's not really, it's hard to see in the shot here, but uh, up here at the top, there's a sticker that says MC00234415 in black on white, and then on black on gray, it says 1808. And that looks like it's a sticker. I'm, I am, this is a guess, right? <laughs> but this is an educated guess. I think that is probably a serial number, and 1808 is probably a date code. And if this is a date code, then that probably means that this, or it may mean that this was uh, completed in the 18th week of the year 2008. So that would be like early May 2008. Um, a lot of times you will see four digit date codes and that tells you which, um, like when it was made. Uh, that also tells the manufacturer like which print, which manufacturing run was this part of. And that's helpful in case there's a problem. They can go back and say, hey, there's a problem with all the, everything that came off the line on the 18th week of 2008. And then they could isolate those. Um, otherwise, like this is all basic kind of stuff here explaining that this is a safe product, basically saying don't throw it away because it's e-waste. Um, you know, everything else here is pretty straightforward. But if we're trying to figure out the origins of this device, we're gonna have to take a much closer look at the markings on this chip to figure out what we can and maybe do a little bit of research on 1808 to see if that's a, a plausible origin date for this uh, particular object. Um, the chip almost certainly did not come from the same factory as everything else in here. Usually if you're making a, a product like this, you're gonna design it in a way that, that requires or uses someone else's chips. And so you're gonna buy a bunch of those chips to stick into your guitar controllers. So uh, I'm gonna see what I can find out about this. It is really hard to see, but there are some markings on that chip that I think could be helpful. So let's see what we can find out. Here's a closer look at the chip from the Guitar Hero controller that I just took apart. And it's hard to make out, I think, but um, I did the best I could with my, my phone camera. You can see on the first line it says F0511, the second line says S410, and the last line says 811KM. And um, I don't know, so this is the kind of thing where you see these numbers and you, your first inclination probably is to put them into Google and sometimes that works and most of the time it does not because most of the time these are going to be context specific numbers that only have meaning in the context of this particular chip manufacturer. Uh, so far I have not been able to figure out the chip manufacturer because this chip is so small that it does not have room for the logo of the manufacturer. Sometimes they do and I'll show you an example here in a moment. Uh, but often you can figure that out. Uh, there is a good chance that one of the top two lines is the date code, most likely the middle one there, S410. Um, but unfortunately, oops, I didn't mean to go ahead. I, I don't I, I don't have a way to interpret that into any of the schemas for date codes that I know. 0511 could be a date code as well. In terms of this chip, the only date that would make sense would be 05 as in the year 2005, but that's an uncommon way to write 2005. Uh, and also 2005 is a little bit unlikely because I have another date code on this guitar controller that I think points to 2008. So I, I feel like a chip that was has been laying around for three years old, for three years probably isn't going to be used in this controller, but I'm, I'm, I'm really guessing and speculating a lot. Um, now here's another chip. This is a chip from a mouse, a trackball mouse that I found, and this is a chip that has quite a bit more information on it, and I was actually able to find out a lot about it. Um, on the left, you can see the logo for the manufacturer and then you've got these three rows of information about it. And I'll show you what those mean in a moment. First, your first challenge is to figure out what is this logo for? And it was a bit of a challenge actually. Um, you can find, if you look for IC manufacturer logos, uh, integrated circuit is, is the technical name for these, so IC. You can find different web pages that have a, a chart of these. Uh, the problem with that is that like, Unless you know the name of it, you can't search for it by name, so you have to just visually scroll until you see the one you're looking for. And this is one I did not recognize. You, there are some that are pretty recognizable, like GE or Texas Instruments or uh, Matsushita, but uh, this one I had not seen before, or at least if I have seen it before, I don't remember. Uh, but it was pretty distinctive. If you look at it, it's kind of a kind of a tree, maybe a sunset in the background. So a pretty interesting looking. Um, logo. Eventually, and you can actually see it here, uh, I did locate it and determine that it belongs to uh, Cypress, which is this uh, uh, chip manufacturer. And I googled, uh, oh, I searched on their uh, website for some of the letter combinations on the chip. So PV, PVXC, in this case, hit pay dirt, uh, as it were. And if you look at it here, this is the all the product specs for the PVXC chip. So PVXC is the, the four digit thing and then the CY7C63413C that also appears on my chip 
um, here. So I'm, I'm confident that this is the right chip that the, I've got some information about here. And this is actually really good. Um, this is a, a lot of great information. Um, for example, it even, they even have down here an explanation of the marking formats. I've got it open in this tab here, I think. Yeah, let's see. Um, and this actually explains what the different markings mean and how to decode the date and everything. So pretty cool. So this is telling me that the, the date code follows a year, year, week, week format. So looking at my chip, I can see uh, those four digits here are 0749. So that tells me that this was made in the 49th week of 2007. So that would be like December, I think, right? So um, uh, December of 2007. So great, I got that figured out. Um, they go by weeks of manufacture because they think of a week as a, a production run typically. So that, but that's great. Um, the other information that's interesting here is the uh, country of origin. So this tells me that this has a three-digit country of origin and gives me an example, PHI, which is convenient because that's actually what my uh, thing says too, PHI as the country of origin. So that tells me that this chip was made in December 2007 in the Philippines. So great, I'm getting pretty specific there right, uh, already. Um, I can get even more specific because on the Cypress website, they actually have a list of all of their different um, production facilities and they're all over the world, but they have, it turns out, two in the Philippines. So there's one at this location, Gateway Business Park, and this one in the Laguna Techno Park. And so I've narrowed it down to two very specific locations and that's pretty cool. So um, I looked at both of these on Google Maps uh, just to kind of see, uh, this is Cypress Semiconductor Philippines. This seems to be their main organization because uh, the main location because the, the name of it is their location and they've got they've actually got reviews and stuff uh, if you look at it on street view too um, I bet that will be interesting let's see um, yeah you know it's a big factory you can kind of see it there in the corner um, it's the looks like it's been there a while I guess um, actually it looks like it's not in very good shape but oh, maybe that's it on the other corner anyway this is this is a pretty big looking facility in fact it looks like it's dedicated to uh, Cyprus. So um, pretty cool. I wonder if I'm looking at the wrong direction. I think it's I think it's over in that direction. I think it's that blue and white building actually uh, based on the picture from the Google Maps preview. So that's probably it but I do have another address. The other address is over here and um, I, I can't tell as much about this and I, I can't actually uh, or Google couldn't find the exact address. So it is somewhere in this Laguna Techno Park um, and if you look at, you know, you can use Google Street View, it turns out, just to kind of click on different random locations in here. And it looks like, a, you know, an industrial park. So lots of different warehouse and factory looking buildings, but not much we can tell about what's going on in any of these, at least from Google Street View. So, we, you know, there is there's a chance that it came from here as well. It's just... Um, Hard to say for sure. So, um, uh, I, making an educated guess, I'm going to go with the other one. I'm going to go with uh, the first one that I looked at and called out the address. And that's the address that I included on that slide. You basically repeat that process for every other chip that you can find information about. It does take some educated guesswork and honestly just some luck. As you saw between those two chips that I was looking at, I really hit paydirt on one of those. The other one I'm still struggling with and I really haven't found anything to go on yet. Although I'm going to keep looking. Uh, there's a circle on it that might have been a manufacturer logo, but it, I, I think that's unlikely because it's a pretty um, uninformative logo if it is just a plain circle. Uh, so repeat that process, do your best, and see what you can find out. Uh, and that is, of course, if you are working on the, the uh, prehistory option for the timeline research. Speaking of the prehistory, I found something interesting on the Cypress website on their about page. They have some information about their operations, which is how I found the locations of their different facilities. But they also have some information about how they comply to industry standards. And they also have a lot of information about their supply chain. And this includes information like um, how they contract with different suppliers, how they ensure that different suppliers are um, ethical in their hiring practices and in their labor practices. It even talks about the DRC, which is what we learned about in that article by Kevin Bales. DRC is the D Democratic Republic of the Congo. And they talk here about how they make sure that their objects, their devices aren't made with conflict minerals. So really interesting and I think good on their part to, to show their work and be transparent as much as possible. And this is the kind of thing that you could probably add to or at least somewhat in your timeline if you're investigating the prehistory of an object.
If you're researching the lived history of an electronic object, you're going to have a different kind of work to do. You're probably going to have to go into your memory or your own records or on photo albums to find times when you used this particular object in a particularly memorable way. And it might be a little tricky if this is an object that you haven't really thought much about, um, but that's part of the interesting work of this, uh, this assignment, I think, is to go into your history and think about basically your life through the lens of this particular object and what things stand out, what things are significant. As I've mentioned, the Guitar Hero controller that I took apart is not actually mine, so I don't actually have any history with this particular object, and so I needed to do a little research to find out when was this produced and speculate, uh, I guess, when it, uh, when it was purchased and, and used. Uh, and I did find this article, and it seems to give a pretty clear reference to it. Um, looking at this particular image, this, this, uh, this picture of the Guitar Hero is the Gibson Les Paul style of Guitar Hero controller. Uh, and it seems that this was released for Guitar Hero 3, which came out in 2007. So that gives me a pretty good frame of reference for this. Uh, the one I'm looking at has some slight differences, like the pickup and the buttons and, and the knob there are all black on the one I'm looking at, but everything else is the same. So I think that it's the same model, but maybe a slightly different version. And this gives me at least some frame of reference uh, for speculating uh, about when my brother-in-law purchased this Guitar Hero 3 controller for his kids. Finally, if you're interested in learning about and speculating about the afterlife of your object, you're going to need to learn about the materials that go into producing it. It will probably be helpful to take it apart at least a little bit to see what's inside of it. But if it's an electronic component, you can count on there being a few things. If it's uh, plastic, it's probably ABS plastic. If it has circuit boards, those are probably made from fiberglass. And there are probably rare earth elements on those circuit boards, um, including different things like selenium and gold. Uh, but in very, very small amounts. You probably have some tantalum if you have some, uh, some resistors, and you probably have copper if you have wiring. So copper, plastic, steel, fiberglass, uh, these are the main materials that go into making most electronic objects. So when you think about its future, think about what could happen in terms of its recyclability. Um, see what you can find out about different electronic recyclers and what their processes are, how they get different things from electronic objects like this and, and what they do with them later. And that's the future that you can speculate for your electronic object. Or you could do something kind of like I did, where think about what happens if this just goes in the ground. Are there any parts of this object that are going to biodegrade? Um, the plastic might, depending on what kind of plastic it is. Uh, if you have uh, ABS plastic though, ABS plastic as far as I can tell does not really biodegrade. So, um, you know, that that's probably going to be there for a long time. Uh, and, and as uh, you may know, if you research biodegradation, even when we talk about plastic biodegrading, basically we're talking about it transforming from a big thing into lots and lots of millions of tiny little things. And those go into the environment and they just stay there and they become part of the environment and they end up in our, our water and in our food and in our bodies. So, you know, that's not great either. <laughs> and so there's lots of things that are kind of depressing to think about, but this is the kind of thing we do need to be aware of as consumers of electronic products. And that's the kind of thing I hope that you can find out with uh, find out about when you research and think about the afterlife of your electronic object if you choose that option for your timeline. That about does it for today's video. Uh, good luck in your investigations and your research. Um, I will be on the road on Thursday, so I probably won't be able to reply very quickly to any requests for help, but if you do get stuck on something that you're investigating, please ask, and I'll get to it when I can if I, and, and try to help if, if I can. I don't know. Uh, that's part of the fun of this project. I don't know what you're going to find, and I, I may or may not be able to help, but I'll do my best, uh, just as I'm sure you'll do your best as well. Uh, on Friday, I will be back home, so I will be live streaming on Friday, and on Friday I will be talking about how to work with Timeline JS, which is the product I'd like for you to use to actually share the information that you found in your investigation. So that's all for now. I hope you're doing well. Have a good day.